going to, so back onto the topic here. So if you're going to create a rootless system, first thing you're going to have to deal with are your set UID root programs. Set UID root programs know that they run as root because I'm set UID. Some of them will even check and say, is my set UID bit, is my set, UID bit set? And, am I, and am I running as UID zero? At which point it will say, great, I am. That means I can do anything I want. First thing I'm going to do is, of course, I'm going to change my UID to somebody else so I don't have privilege. Uh, which they're not going to have privilege to do, and that will fail. And most of them, being very uh, cleverly written programs, will know this will never fail, and will go their way along their way, um, running as as root with no privilege, um, creating files, assuming that they're creating files as the other users, and then they'll try to create files in directories where they can't do it because they're not the right user, and they'll get all confused and break. But that's not an un un unsolvable problem. Uh, any important programs, you'll detect that fairly early on, and you can go fix those. Um, a little bit more difficult is what do you do with init and cron? That is, what are you going to do with your init scripts? Your system starts up. Um, what capabilities do you give your programs that are going to run all your system services? Uh, you're, you've got two choices there. Um, the obvious choice is going to be just yeah, run them without, yeah, don't use your PR control in there. Don't turn true capabilities on for them. Just leave them running. Uh, the other option is explicitly you know, set your scripts to run them with the right capabilities. Either way uh, has advantages. I'll talk more about that in a bit here. OK, system databases. Uh, your system databases are still going to be out there owned by UID0. What are you going to do about those? Uh, are you going to leave them? Are you going to change them? Hmm. That's one of those uh, sticky issues here. And things will go wrong anyway. Okay. So again, what about the set UID root programs? Uh, set UID becomes a discretionary access control mechanism. What does that mean? How many of you know what a discretionary access control mechanism is? How many of you don't know what a discretionary control access control mechanism is? How many of you wonder why you're here? <laughs> oh, okay, we got, we got some people who are honest, at least. All right. Uh, discretionary access control mechanism is really a, it, it, your basic access control mechanism. It's an access control mechanism where you get to decide who has access to your stuff. Okay, it's at your discretion. This is as opposed to a mandatory access control scheme where you don't get to decide who has access control to it, even if it's yours. Uh, so set UID becomes a mechanism whereby I can set the set UID bit on a file that I own, and then Russell can run that program as me. Yeah, that's one reason why I don't do that very often. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Actually, I do trust Russell. Uh, that's what's scary. <laughs> um, so, set UID root programs just mean that they're programs that can access system databases now. They can't necessarily do any of the other things that they used to be able to do. They can't do the things that require real privilege. They can't change my my ownership of my files. They can't delete your files, uh, but they can go and modify Etsy password, they can go modify the capabilities database so that when I log in, I can run in with all capabilities. You know, there's still power there, and you can't deny that there's power there, but it's different. All right. Um, so instead of doing a set UID root on a program that you want to run with privilege, you put a file capability on it. Or capa yeah, a file capability set on it, which lists the capabilities that you want the program to run with. And you can also list the, pro the capabilities you want the program to never run with. So if you never want that program to have cap proof port, you leave that out of its inheritable set. And no matter what, that program, when that program is, is executed, even if the process that, ex that exec it had that privilege, that privilege will get dropped. You'll never be able to use it. So um, you have a fine-grained control over what you can and can't do. And again, that granularity is based on the kinds of things that, he, that a Linux system can do. 
Figuring out the set of capabilities you want to have on a program uh, can be a little bit trying. Uh, audit trails are a real, uh, real good help for that, although the audit trail doesn't always contain all the information you want to have. Uh, but it's getting better there. So the init and startup scripts, um, these things are traditionally run as root because I'm going to you know, fire up my network daemons and I'm going to fire up my logical volume manager and I'm going to fire up the, the mail service. And I don't want to put the set UID bit on those things because I don't want anybody to just come along and run them, but I do want them run with privilege when I start them up. So the easy way to do it is you just set all the capabilities and go. And you say, all right, this, this thing's going to run with all capabilities. I'll just let it run. Um, and the alternative is you can say, all right, we'll run it with no capabilities. When it fails, we'll figure out which capability it didn't have. We'll add that to it, and then we'll let it run. Um, this will work probably 90, 95% of the time. But then you'll get back to those programs that say, hey, look, my UID isn't zero. I'm going to stop. Or they will say, my UID is zero. Um, but I tried this operation and it failed, therefore you must not support these things, therefore I'm going to go do something different. Those are the ones that are fun, uh, the ones that behave differently in the present, yeah, that check, say, yeah, do I have, have what I need? Oh, yes. Oh, look, I don't. Okay, I'll behave differently. So you, you think your system is running when in fact it isn't. Uh, we also have, have cases like cron tabs. Um, what do you do about a cron tab for room? Yeah, you probably want that to run without privilege. Well, maybe. Um, that kind of gets defeats the purpose, though, of having a least privilege system if all you have to do is put something in your cron tab. Um, it gets to be a, a little bit tricky there. Yes, sir? Could you modify the, the cron tab program to make a cron spool file which is labeled with uh, the capability set that matches the process that, that wrote it? Yes, but that would be wrong. Uh, and I say that um, with a, the very simple notion that if you try to do that, what you end up with is a veritable ex explosion of cron tab files. And you violate a lot of the security principles of simplicity. Uh, the principle of least astonishment is, is my favorite there. Because what that says is you end up with a cron tab at each set of capabilities you might actually want to use. You got, end up with 34 cron tabs, and you're trying to figure out why do I have 34 cron tabs. And it just doesn't really work very well. Uh, generally, what you want to have is something, a program like CHACAP, which very, or new cap rather, like, which would be like new group, which runs your process with a set of capabilities that you're permitted to have. And then you put that into your cron tab. That makes things run a whole lot smoother, and it requires fewer modifications to the cron tab, cron facility, and you don't have to pass the information around. It just simplifies things dramatically. Okay, so the answer is yes, you could do that. You could that, and and in fact, it's been things like that have been done in mandatory access control environments, and uh, I've personally done it three times, and each time I did it, I made it, I ratcheted down the capabilities that were available as the the kinds of things you could do, because it just gets too too hairy, too fast, and uh, it's unnecessary. In spite of the fact, SE Linux does that very thing. All right, system data. So the system data is probably the most important thing you have out there because it controls what happens to everything else. Uh, it's, still, it's got to still be owned by root. Yes, by gosh, people have tried in uh, pure capability systems to remove the user ID completely. So user ID zero just doesn't get used. You make the system databases owned by, by some other user. That doesn't work. There's just too much out there that cares that these system databases are owned by UID zero. 
there are too many programs to check to make sure that the, the Etsy password they're going to use is in fact owned by UID0, and if it isn't, they're just not going to play. Um, so you any root programs are going to check and make sure that the mode bits are right. And say, so, hey, my name is UID0. Hey, this file is owned by, owned by me. Okay, oh, look, the mode bits are, yeah, the mode bits have got to be just right. And the owner hey, it's not owned by root. I'm not, not going to deal with this. A uh, good example here is Etsy Shadow. Etsy Shadow is, is traditionally kept at mode uh, 600. 400. Zero, zero. Um, so that 6, no, Etsy Shadow. Uh, pff, yeah, okay. You don't want anybody, you don't want anybody reading it except for privileged processes. Uh, if you're not running privileged processes per se, uh, you don't want it generally accessible. If you make that owned by somebody other than root, then most of the programs that run as root aren't going to be able to read it. Now, you can overhaul the entire system and make those files owned by somebody else uh, with the user ID, say, one. Uh, it has never been successfully done. Everybody who's tried it gave up. And I only tried it twice, and I gave up. Um, So if you so so what do you do instead? Well, yeah, you you have a root login. Uh, you make it capability free, and so he can go and modify the system databases all he wants, but he can't do anything about it once he's done that. So go modify all the system databases, and then call up the guy who's got privilege to reboot the system because you can't do it yourself. And no matter what you do, there's always going to be some joker out there. Usually somebody who's paying for the system. This is what it really hurts, you know, okay? Because you know, if it was just some other some user who, who's getting it for free, you just say, ah, well, that's the way it's supposed to work. But if they're paying you for it, then they're going to say, yes, but how do I get real root? Then you smile sweetly and you tell them, well, we, we have a program here. It's called NewCap. Uh, it will give you capabilities based on the set that that particular user is allowed. And typically what they're going to say is, great, so how do I set it up so that root can have all privilege and become real root again. So you have the mechanism. They pay extra for the mechanism. And then you tell them how to get around it, because that's what they want. <sighs> Sigh. All right, so what have I? Excuse me? OK, so what have I got next here? Um, so what won't work? Uh, as you can imagine, um, anything that that actually aggressively checks the security state of the system is going to break because you're changing your, your fundamental underlying privilege model on the system. So anything that checks for UID 0, anything that's going to be looking for uh, file ownerships, anything that's going to be checking what capabilities it has under the old Linux scheme, uh, it's just going to go flop onto the floor. Uh, programs that drop privilege are probably not going to work. Um, if they're running, running UID 0 and they say, I'm going to change my UID to something else and root, again, doesn't have privilege, it won't be able to do that. So it's not going to work right. And again, you know, too many programs that drop privilege just, just assume that, well, I've got privilege, therefore I can drop it. Well, not if it requires privilege to change your privilege state. Um, and this really comes down to most security conscious code is going to break. Because, again, you're changing your security model. And when you change your security model, the code that cares about the security of the system is going to stop working right. Uh, it's not that big a deal to change it, but these things are going to break. And unfortunately, these things tend to break in, in hidden and mysterious ways. There are several places in libc, for example, uh, that are going to be doing checks that you wouldn't expect. Uh, you're going to have to deal with that. And so, so here's my favorite slide. I, I have to put this one up every time. It's like, why not just use SE Linux? Uh, capabilities are authoritative. All right. If you have a capability, you can do the thing. Uh, if you can get the capability, you can do the thing you're not allowed to do otherwise. SE Linux is restrictive. It is only allowed to restrict things that you would otherwise be able to do. So if you're not allowed to do something, SE Linux won't allow you to do it. If, excuse me? 
That's a feature. It's the way it's supposed to be. It's designed that way. Really. Um, with capabilities, you can grant somebody a, somebody a privilege to do something, but that's the you can't. All you can do is tell them, no, you can't do that for some reason other than the mode bits. This is true, by the way, of any LSM. This is true of Snack. It's true of App Armor. It's true of, of Tomorrow. It's a design feature of the LSM mechanism is that it's a restrictive addition to the security, ca security features of the system, whereas capabilities are, the, are kind of the underlying privilege mechanism. So you can raise your privilege using the mechanism. I'm sorry. What? The, the reason for this choi design choice in the LSM is that uh, if you make a mistake with an LSM module, you won't grant inappropriate privileges. Whereas uh, with capabilities put in grant privileges, you grant inappropriate privileges. This is a, like a, a frequently asked question. Uh, what if I misconfigure and they name an LSM module? Well, the worst case scenario is it's as insecure as a uh, stock Linux system. Whereas capability as well. That's right, yeah. Uh, yes. So it, yeah. So the LSMs are, again, yeah, they're, they're strictly additional checks. Um, So no, I'll r wrap up uh, here. So the conclusion on this is you can create a rootless system. It's been done. Uh, it's been done in the Unix space in a couple of different ways. Uh, in fact, the first time it was done was in 1987. A company called Gould. Do any of you remember Gould? Oh, oh there's uh, they got two people here. Uh, they, that guy up in the royal boxes again. He knows everything. Um, <laughs> What they did is they said, all right, we're no UID zero, um, no system files. Everything's a service, and uh, everything was, was implemented as a socket. So you wanted to do something, you'd call off to the service. You wanted to get, you know, get PWN was rewritten to be nothing but a call out to the, the service, a response from that. Uh, you, you could have a set UID D program. But again, it was just a discretionary, mac a discretionary mechanism. Um, the Irix product, uh, more recently than that, um, was actually capable of running without root. Um, and this is just you know, strictly commercially available Unix. So it can be done. Um, it requires that you do a lot of setup. It requires you know, databases to set the capabilities properly. It requires extended attributes on the file systems. Um, but it has been done. It requires distribution level support in order to make it work properly. As you, your libraries have to all, you, you have to go out and clean all the dependencies on the set you, uh, on the, the root mechanism out of the libraries. You got to clean it out of the programs. You got to make sure that all the programs that, that you have out there um, deal with capabilities either by yeah, you know, by default, by caveat, or by uh, explicit design, um, and you need to test the bedickens out of it to make sure that it's not doing any of the classic failures of the capability scheme. Uh, it can be done. It can be done transparently most of the time. Again, except for those few programs that are really cognizant of their security state, and. It, in any case, there will be some issues. There will be some things that just aren't going to work right. Some, th some things that got to be changed in order to, to work in the capability environment. So I think that was OK. So here's my contact information, just in case anybody cares. Um, let's see. So um, I have my. Both my, my vanity domain and my Gmail address is here because on occasion, one of the major um, internet providers here in Australia can't get through to my, my regular domain, and I don't really know why, but OK. So questions? Yes. Can this be applied to existing 
uh, running software? Yes. Um, or that is, if a process is running, can you give it a capability? No, you cannot set the capabilities on a running process. And the rationale behind that is fairly straightforward. Because you can't necessarily tell what, where that process came from, uh, giving it privilege on the flat, or what state it's in. Um, there are some demon processes where you can imagine that you might want to do that, say, I want SendMail to have privilege to delete other people's files now because, I want, because I'm going to do a mailbox clean and turn it off outside control of that program, but then you've got to communicate that fact to the program, it just gets too hairy. Um, and it's too dangerous if, again, you know, once I break into the program that gives other processes privilege, then I can just give processes privilege that I want. I can give another process, like my program that's, that's running, um, I can give it the privilege to give other processes privilege and then drop the privilege over here. Um, I have no way to constrain what privileges I give out, so it just gets too dangerous. Um, well, what that means is you, you put the, if, if you want a program to run with a particular set of privileges, you can either put it on the file or have it invoked with those privileges. Um, so I untar a file that has... I untar a file that has extended attributes with capability privileges in it. How do I either, well, how do I make those authentic and consequently how do I prevent a bad guy uh, doing the same? All right, so the answer to this is twofold. First off, you have to have the privilege to set the, you have to have the, cap have the capability to set the capabilities on the file. Um, and how do you identify that they're off? First off, Tar isn't going to do that for you. You need a program which is aware of extended attributes in order to, to do that. Uh, interestingly enough, there have been versions of Tar that have been able to do that. Uh, but in any case, you need to have enough privilege to set the capability set on the file in order to set the capability set on the file for that to be a problem. Have I confused you yet? Ah, uh, so the question is, how is that different than the ability to set it on a running process? The ability to set the capabilities on a file so that the file runs with those capabilities is less dangerous than setting it on a running process because if I set it on a file, I know what file I'm setting it on. I know what program I'm setting it on. Whereas if it's a... Whereas if it's a running process, who knows what's gone? Yeah, yeah. It may have been taken over by Russell. Well, I, <laughs> in, in which case, who knows what's going on in there? <laughs> Stop calling me Shirley. <laughs> if a person is aware of capabilities, then uh, it might have uh, realized the startup didn't have a certain capability. I and mean, if you grant it later on, by running an assumption it doesn't have it. So for example, if a program drops capability to take an override, and then starts uh, unlinking some files because it knows it can't un unlink the inappropriate ones, and you suddenly grant it that capability, then things go horribly wrong. Well, it's quite reasonable for a program to say, I'll change my UID to a certain UID, and then delete every file owned by that user, or, or, or in a directory uh, writable by that user. If you then grant a DAC override and it uh, goes for other files, other directories. And it is definitely the case that there are multiple ways using the capability system to achieve, achieve a particular end. Uh, you know, for example, you can change your user, if you have the capability to change your user ID, that's not very different from having the capability to delete other people's files. Um, Whether the current grant, yeah, the granularity of the capabilities, um, I, 
I mentioned it earlier on, it's a matter of, of, uh, of taste. Um, do you want to have a separate cap you know, do you want to say, well, since these, these capabilities are clearly um, identical in their behavior, why have two separate capabilities? Um, another question is, excuse me? Sure, why not? Uh, one problem is that there are, are some uh, situations of race conditions in the standard uh, core utilities. So, for example, uh, if uh, an RM minus RF could be tricked into going down the wrong directory tree, then you, you get some uh, nasty results. So, I think it would be a benefit to be able to uh, run RM as root and tell it to set its, its UID to a particular user's UID so it only deletes uh, files on behalf of that user. And uh, if you uh, then suddenly grant this uh, DAC override, it would then uh, go off and do the things you don't want it to do. So uh, being able to uh, set itself to a particular UID and only delete files on that UID is a benefit of having uh, uh, the capability to change UID or set UID capability instead of uh, DAC override, for example. Uh, okay, so uh, on the other hand, most people who write these programs don't think, don't think to that level of um, detail. Uh, so you get a lot of things that behave in, in uh, less sophisticated ways than that, that don't take things like that into account. So again, the granularity becomes something that people will argue about um, ad nauseum. Yeah. So any other questions here? Yes, sir. Okay, so okay, so so the question is, can you give, can I give a practical example where capabilities are better a, a better choice for your mechanism than SC Linux or AppArmor or Smack or Tomoyo or yeah, fill in the blank. If you want to use a low numbered port. And you want all the users who are on the red team to be able to use low numbered ports instead of those that are necessarily owned by you know, those processes that are run, run in his root. In fact, that's the only, pro the only privileged thing you want those members of the red team to be able to do. You can give them the capability to access the privileged ports. Now, they're running as themselves. They can access the privileged privilege ports. They don't have any other privilege. Okay. Um, and so you've, you've provided that mechanism. They're now, you can say that that's a more secure environment because they're not running as root. They can't do other things. They can get a message. You know, they can talk over, the, over this privilege port, get some information, make a decision based on that. But that doesn't necessarily mean, no, that doesn't mean that they can go do these other bad things. Now you can say that you can set up you can set up or configure these other schemes so that you could run as root and not be able to do those things either, but you would have to set up explicitly all the things that you couldn't do as opposed to the capabilities mechanism, which is to say you can't do anything except this one thing. Here's the one thing that you're allowed to do that is in violation of system policy. Thank you. Okay, I'll take this guy's question. I was just actually going to summarize what you said in this slightly sort of form. You believe in this principle of least privilege. It's much easier to describe least privilege rather than what you can't do. Okay, so, so the comment here is that if you believe in the principle of least privilege, it's much easier to explain what you can do if, yeah. if you just say, here are the things you can do, as opposed to saying, here are the things you can't. Um, because there are lots and lots and lots of things you could do, but if you explicitly said, here is the one that you're allowed to do, it does get simpler. Uh, one of the criticisms that's been le le leveled against SE Linux on occasion uh, is that the policies are a bit complex. Um, 
And I, I think that even its ad adherents will pretty well ac acknowledge that. So, uh, uh, he just said security is hard, and I disagree with him. Um, it's been solved several times. <laughs> ah, well, it's true. I'm, most security problems are neither security problems nor computer problems. Uh, but we won't go there now because I'm out of time. Oh, I got one. I got a question. <laughs> Okay, so, so the question here is what, what kind of mechanism is involved when you do a fork uh, with the capabilities? And the answer is that in 2.6.28, it's, it's just part of your task structure. Okay, so it's just copied like your UID, all the other, other credentials. Um, in 2.6.29, one way or the other, it will either be still be that or it will be part of the credential structure. But the, in either case, the answer is it's just copied. So you get the same capability set as your, as your parent when you do the fork. Now when you do the exec, there's a, a sophisticated computation that's done in order to describe what the current capability set is. Um, and I probably should have, gone, should have had a slide on that, but quite frankly, um, brains tend to explode when they see the computation. So I didn't do that. Okay, I'm going to not answer your question here at this point, okay, because we need to wrap up. Anybody else here? Oh, yes, sir. What do you do about single user mode? Okay, he says, what do you do about single user mode? Well, if you're single user mode, you, haven't, you don't set your, you don't call the PR control, which, goes in, which says go into, into uh, full capability mode, unless you fixed all your programs. Okay. Um, and on some systems, some of the Unix systems, one of the first things in it did was effectively the PR control which says turn off, turn off root. Okay. All right, so thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we'll break for, uh, for a morning tea, and then we'll come back for a real talk. <laughs> <laughs>